Hello, everyone. While we provide a moment for everyone to sign in, if you would kindly use the chat box to enter your name and organization you are representing, and we would really appreciate that, and we will get started momentarily. Give a few more seconds. All right, well, welcome. Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Introduction to Vector Management, What is a Vector, and Why Are They Important? My name is Nicole Dutra Marquez. I'm a Senior Project Coordinator for the National Environmental Health Association. Today's webinar is intended as an introduction to the world of vector control and management. Today, you will learn how to better identify vector species from other environmental public health pests of concern. To kick off the webinar, you will hear from NEHA's Vector Control Program Committee Chair, who will tell you about the committee and the work that they do. Then we will move into our guest speaker's presentation, which will be followed by our, by our panel discussion featuring top experts in the field who will be able to share their knowledge and best practices. At that time, we will open the floor for any questions from our audience. Upon closing of the discussion period, I will share some highlights regarding this year's 86th Annual Educational Conference hosted by NEHA and a couple other closing announcements. With that, allow me to cover a few housekeeping items before we get started. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available on NEHA's, NEHA's website on the Vector Control Program Committee's webpage. If you have any questions throughout the, today's webinar, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to post any questions and or comments you have for today's guest speaker and our panelists. And lastly, at the conclusion of today's webinar, you will receive a link to take part in an evaluation survey where, where you'll be able to provide us feedback, comments, and suggestions on today's webinar. With that, let us begin. Let me begin by introducing NEHA's Vector Control Program Committee Chair, Lieutenant Commander George Carroll. George serves as an environmental health officer with the United States Public Health Service. He is assigned as a regional public health consultant for seven national parks in California, including Yosemite, Death Valley, and Sequoia. In his role, he provides public health program management and oversight for park leadership and staff, assessing risks associated with food service facilities, drinking water, and wastewater utility systems, as well as vector-borne zoonotic and communicable diseases affecting park staff and visitors. He has been with the National Park Service Office of Public Health since 2017 and a registered environmental health specialist, registered sanitarian with NEHA since 2011. Previously, he served as a county sanitarian in North Carolina and as an environmental health specialist with the Indian Health Service, providing environmental health support to four Arizona tribes. Now I will pass the floor over to George. George, it's all yours. Thank you, Nicole. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you again for being here. Um, got a great lineup of information and clearly a rock star panel uh, coming up, so I won't take too long to get us straight to that. Um, really quickly, I wanted to talk about our committee um, within NEHA and what we do. Um, you see our mission here. Basically, we are a resource for you all, the environmental health field staff and NEHA leadership, um, to provide resources, programs, and really foster um, the environment for improvement of vector control programs that protect public health. And of course, with all of us, our, our key focus is protecting health. Some priority areas of our committee, um, really identifying resource gaps and needs uh, for guidance, for the best practices, successes, um, and then of course, all the challenges we face in the field, uh, specifically with vector control. Um, as part of this webinar today, we do put out guidance um, in different materials for the, for the field. And so this webinar today will be recorded and will be one of those resources available on our website. Um, next slide, please. 
uh, doing a little digging into the historical files of, of when the committee originated. It was uh, the 2018-2019 operating year, so still a relatively new committee um, comprised of state, local, federal staff um, involved in environmental health and vector control. Um, and I would just say we um, are probably looking for members later this year around fall time. So just keep an eye on the NEHA social media for that announcement coming out. And then just a couple links here for your awareness. Um, NEHA has a great vector page. There's the vector toolkit on there. That's the first link you see there. And then the second uh, specifically is the committee website and some of the information about our committee. Next slide, please. And just a quick recognition for our committee members. Um, currently, uh, they're listed here. And then I have to give a special shout out to our wonderful NEHA staff, of course, who you just heard from uh, Nicole and also Chris Walker, um, who really helped keep us on track and make sure everything goes smoothly uh, in our committee. So thank you all for your time and, and efforts on the committee. And with that, I will introduce our first speaker. Um, Dr. Caroline Estathian was born and raised in South Florida and still resides in the state. She received her BS and MS in biology from Florida Atlantic University, a certificate in biomedical sciences from Barry University, and her PhD in entomology from the University of Florida. Dr. Estathian is currently the Southeast Regional Director for Vector Disease Control International, or VDCI, overseeing their mosquito abatement programs in Florida, Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. Prior to joining VDCI, she worked at Volusia County Mosquito Control, where she headed up their research and arboviral surveillance programs. She also worked at Anastasia Mosquito Control as their research and arboviral surveillance program, as a medical entomologist in the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services as a mosquito control outreach specialist for the Northeast region. She was a microbiology professor at St. John's River State College in Florida Atlantic University. Her graduate research focused on improved conservation of endangered parrots with the use of a push-pull method to reduce nest site competition with Africanized honeybees. Fascinating. Uh, and additionally, she evaluated the impact of other arthropods, including mosquitoes, on nestling bird health and survival. The floor is all yours, Dr. Ostathian. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, George. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, I'm going to give a brief overview about what a vector is, who they are, and start giving you guys an understanding of why vectors are so important. Oh, there we go. All right, so what is a vector? So a vector is something that transmits pathogens that may cause disease. This is most commonly through the bite of fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes. The pathogen or disease agent is usually going to be a virus, a bacteria, or a parasite. We consider vector transmission biological transmission because the pathogen actually must reproduce in the vector um, and go through that transmission um, and is typically going to be transmitted through the bite of that vector. So we're gonna go over some just general disease terminology and transmission cycle terminology to make sure that you have a good understanding of how vector transmission works and um, can understand it better. So the first type of disease transmission is vertical. So this would be from parent to offspring. So this is gonna be things like um, HIV, cytomegalovirus, chicken pox, um, chlamydia. So these are things that the child would get um, from the parent in utero. Um, the other type is horizontal. This is the much more common method of transmission. Um, can also be called um, direct transmission because it's going to go from person to person uh, through direct contact, um, through touching or through droplet transmission by um, sneezing or coughing. Um, it can also be transmitted from an animal to a person. In this case, we would call that a zoonotic disease or zoonotic transmission. Vector transmission is a form of horizontal transmission, but rather than being direct, we would consider this indirect because the animal and the person never actually come into direct contact with each other. So when a disease organism is transmitted from one animal to a person through an intermediate, um, we consider that vector transmission. So that's indirect, again, because there's no direct contact between that animal and the person. 
And the most common vectors are arthropods. So mosquitoes and fleas, which are insects and ticks, which are, are arachnids. So let's look at the typical transmission cycle. So I have one up here from a mosquito and one from a tick. Um, so you might hear reservoir host a lot. So the reservoir is basically where that disease agent is harboring. And typically they're not gonna be seriously affected by the disease. The pathogen wants to reproduce in that host and spread. So if it makes that host so sick that it dies quickly, it's not going to be able to spread. So typically reservoir hosts are not going to be seriously affected by these pathogens. Now the other type of host that we have is called the incidental host. And this is what humans um, typically are. And so an incidental host is one that wasn't the target or it's not the preferred host of that pathogen. Now the effects in this incidental host can vary greatly. There can be absolutely no effect to extreme effect that can lead to death. We also term these dead end hosts. And the reason is because the pathogen typically cannot replicate in a high enough amount that it can be picked up by another vector and the transmission cycle can continue. So once a pathogen gets into these incidental or non-preferred hosts, um, it typically can't reproduce and continue its life cycle. So that's why we term them dead end hosts. Another type of host you might hear sometimes is called an amplifier host or an amplification host, which is essentially the same thing as a reservoir host. The difference here um, basically is just saying that the pathogen can amplify in the host versus a dead end host where it can't. So if you look at our West Nile transmission cycle, the reservoir for West Nile are bird species. So your typical cycle is gonna be mosquito bird, mosquito bird. If that mosquito happens to bite a horse or a human, those would be your incidental or dead end hosts. Similar situation with the ticks. Ticks tend to have um, a broader range of hosts. So mammals, rodents, birds, and reptiles. And typically they're going to cycle, the pathogen's gonna cycle from these hosts and the ticks. Now, if a person or a dog happens into an area where the ticks are, then they can get that tick and then possibly be infected by the pathogen. So the last set of terminology we're gonna go over briefly is um, with frequency of disease. So an epidemic um, is gonna be an increase in the number of diseases over a specific time. Typically it's a short period of time. Um, so it's like a small outbreak. If that outbreak or epidemic happens to be worldwide such as COVID was, then we have a pandemic. Um, and when we talk about vector diseases, two of the important terms are endemic disease and exotic. So endemic disease is one that's established in an area or in a population. It's constantly present, typically at low levels. Um, you can see um, sporadic epidemics, even with endemic diseases. So those kind of like a baseline level and occasionally um, due to weather or frequency of vectors or reservoir hosts, you might see some um, increases in disease incidence. Now an exotic disease on the other hand is one that doesn't normally occur in a region. Um, it never occurred there or it did occur, but it was previously eradicated. Um, these are not permanently established. And in the case of mosquito exotic viruses, once the disease has gone from the human population, it's not going to persist in the mosquito population because humans are the reservoir for these exotic mosquito diseases in the United States and other parts of the world, um, monkeys can be reservoirs. So that's why you'll see some of these exotic diseases that we're gonna talk about in a few minutes um, are always are endemic in other parts of the world, but not in the United States. So let's move on to our vectors. Um, so the first one, uh, mosquitoes. So mosquitoes are arthropods, they're in the phylum Arthropoda. They are in the class Insecta, so they are insects, they have six legs. They are in the order Diptera, so they're flies. Any insect with two wings is considered a fly, it's a Diptera, and they're in the family, family Culicidae. Most species of mosquitoes are just a nuisance, um, but even if they're not spreading disease, um, they can still impact the economy and tourism. There are over 3,500 species worldwide, uh, with over 200 in the United States, but only approximately 12 of these can transmit diseases to humans. So. Again, most of our mosquitoes are nuisance, but the ones that can vector disease are very important. So what are these diseases and their vectors? So the endemic diseases in the US, so again, these are ones that are established permanently here, are West Nile virus, Eastern equine encephalitis, 
St. Louis and La Crosse encephalitis. The vectors for the mosquito species that transmit these uh, for West Nile and St. Louis are going to be your Culex, so Nigra palpus, Plinka fasciatus, Pipians, and Tarsalis. For Eastern Equine encephalitis, Culicida melanura is considered the main vector. However, this mosquito likes to feed on birds preferentially. It doesn't feed on humans all that often, uh, but Cochlatidia perturbans is what we call a bridge vector. So this mosquito likes to feed on birds as well as mammals and humans. So that is the one that is most likely to transmit Eastern equine to humans. And then lacrosse encephalitis, uh, one of the main vectors is Aedes triceriatus. On our exotic imported disease size, we have things like dengue, Zika, and chikungunya. Again, these are diseases that are not um, established. Typically, we have had outbreaks um, of all of these that were locally transmitted in the continent of the United States um, at some point. And there's currently uh, some of that going on in South Florida right now. The main vector for these is Aedes aegypti, uh, along with Aedes albopictus. So briefly, we'll just look at a map of um, an overview of where these mosquito-borne diseases um, have been reported. So the first thing that'll jump out at you is West Nile virus is by and large the most common uh, mosquito-borne disease that we have in the United States. And um, you'll see the other ones are very small pockets of where they are. Um, again, this is going to have to do with the reservoirs and where these vector species are located, but West Nile is definitely the most common one. So in regards to exotic diseases, you may hear things like imported versus locally acquired. So an imported case, when we talk about these exotic viruses like chikungunya, dengue, and Zika, is when a person travels outside of the United States, gets bitten by an infected mosquito, and then comes back home to the United States and then gets diagnosed with this disease. So this is an imported or travel related case. Uh, these are very important for local mosquito controls to know about because we want to make sure that the local mosquitoes don't bite this infected person because if that were to happen, then that pathogen can get into the local mosquito population. And then what can happen is we have uh, what's called local transmission. So this is when a person has not traveled outside of their hometown area, um, but comes down with a mosquito disease. Um, and then that means that it's in the local mosquito population. So this is a much more serious situation. And this we take travel related cases seriously and we respond to them as mosquito control because we want to prevent this from getting into our local mosquito population. All right, moving on to ticks. So these are also arthropods. However, they are not insects, they are arachnids. Um, and we have both soft and hard ticks. Approximately 95% of US reported vector-borne diseases are associated with ticks. So ticks are much more likely to cause disease than uh, even mosquitoes. There's over 900 species of ticks worldwide uh, with over 90 species in the US. And of these 90, approximately 25 are considered problematic for human or animals. So some of the diseases that ticks transmit and their vectors. So Lyme disease is probably the one that you are all the most familiar with. This is caused by a bacteria called Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, the main reservoirs, so the main reservoir hosts for this are white-footed mice and white-tailed deer. Uh, then we have rocky mounted spotted fever, which is caused by a bacteria, Rickettsia rickettsia. Uh, the, um, the tick for this can um, be the uh, vector and the reservoir, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but babyosis is caused by a parasite, so not a bacteria, but Babesia microti. Um, and the white footed mouse is the main reservoir for that one. Ehrlichiosis is a disease caused by several bacteria species of Ehrlichia, and this one, um, the main reservoir are deer. Then you have tularemia, which is caused by the bacteria Francisella tularensis. Wild rabbits are the main reservoir for this one. And then anaplasmosis, which is caused by a bacteria, anaplasma, phytocytophyllum. So looking at our so maps of disease, of uh, tick-borne diseases that have been reported to the CDC since 2018, 
Uh, we have Lyme disease and Rocky Mountain spotted fever should jump out at you as the most prevalent. Um, and you can also see that the northeast coast seems to be the hot spot uh, for a lot of these viruses. And again, that's going to have to do with where our reservoir hosts are located, um, as well as where the vectors are located. And you can see tularemia is the most, uh, has the least incidence of disease of these. So looking at our tick species that vector these diseases, we have the black-legged tick, Isodes scapularis, um, which transmits Lyme disease, babesiosis, and anaplasmosis. You can see the range of that tick on the maps to the right there. And then the western black-legged tick, Isodes pacificus, which transmits Lyme disease and anaplasmosis, uh, has a much uh, stricter range there on the west coast. The brown dog tick and the American dog tick both transmit Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, since their reservoirs are dogs, uh, they are all over the continental United States. And then you have the Lone Star tick, uh, Amblyomaya, which is, transmits ehrlichiosis and tularemia. And then our last vector that we're going to talk about are fleas. Again, arthropod. These are all arthropod-borne diseases um, from arthropod vectors. Class Insecta or Siphonoptera. You're probably all fairly familiar with fleas. They do have a, a small proboscis, not a long one like mosquitoes do for piercing and sucking. Uh, they don't have wings. Their bodies are laterally compressed so they can run through the hairs of animals. Um, and then they have their, they're very uh, adapted for jumping. So there are some diseases in the United States that are transmitted by fleas. Um, the most notable would be plague, which is caused by a bacteria, Yersinia pestis, which is transmitted by oriental rat fleas. So the reservoirs for this would be rats and also prairie dogs. So we do have a, a prairie dog population out in the West that sometimes has outbreaks of plague even within the prairie dogs. So you can get plague um, in the United States. Now plague is indirectly transmitted by vector, but if you get um, pneumonic plague, which settles in the lungs at that point, it can then be transmitted um, directly from person to person. Uh, the other one is marine typhus, Rickettsia typhi. So this is transmitted by cat and oriental rat fleas. Um, and we have cat scratch disease, which is caused by a bacteria Bartonella. So this is transmitted by cat fleas, and people can get this if they get scratched by a cat that's been infected by um, a cat flea. And then the last one is tapeworms. If you happen to accidentally swallow a flea that's infected with tapeworms, you can get tapeworms yourself. Um, so that's a very quick, brief overview of vectors and who they are and what diseases and pathogens they carry. Um, so vector management requires organization at the local, state, and national levels. Um, agencies and institutions need to work together to create vector control support network. And vector management is very much a local challenge and a local solution. Every one is going to have different reservoirs, different levels, prevalence of pathogen, um, different vectors. So it is very much a local challenge. So um, with that, I'll hand it back over to George. And then I appreciate your time. Thank you, Dr. Epstathian. That was a fantastic overview in a short amount of time. So thank you for that. Um, and next, I'll, I'll just go ahead and introduce our guest panelists. Um, First, we have Dr. Roxanne Connolly. Uh, she's the Chief Entomologist, Entomology and Ecology Team Lead for the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, National Center of Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases, Division of Vector-Borne Diseases, Arboviral Disease Branch in Fort Collins, Colorado. She leads a team of experts focused on public health applied research, vector surveillance and control, arboviral disease ecology, and emergency response for vector control. Prior to moving to Fort Collins, Dr. Connolly spent 17 years on the faculty at the University of Florida, working directly with mosquito control programs and county extension agents throughout Florida, addressing mosquito research needs, as well as training and extension programming centered on mosquito biology and control and medical entomology. She mentored graduate students and taught mosquito biology, mosquito control, insecticide resistance, mosquito morphology and identification, and integrated mosquito management. She's a past president of the American Mosquito Control Association and the Florida Mosquito Control Association. Welcome, Dr. Connolly. Our second panelist is Captain Maria Saeed, who's a, a physician, board certified in internal medicine and infectious diseases. 
She first became interested in medicine and public health after serving as a Peace Corps volunteer in Eritrea in 1996 to 1998. After completing her medical training, she served as a CDC Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer based at the Maryland Department of Health. She then worked as a medical officer at the NIH Fogarty International Center and at the FDA Division of Epidemiology at the Center for Biolog Bio Biologics Evaluation and Research. Captain Saeed joined the National Park Service in May 2017 as the Epidemiology Branch Chief for the Office of Public Health where she works on disease prevention, detection, and response with an interest and commitment to the One Health Principle. Welcome, Captain Saeed. And our third panelist is Dr. Daniel Markowski. He's a graduate of Memphis State University with a BS in biology and the University of Rhode Island with an MS in zoology and a PhD in biological sciences. He has been involved in pest control practices since the mid 1980s. He's directed vector management programs throughout the country. In 2003, he accepted a position as IPM director and eventually vice president of aerial operations within Vector Disease Control International or VDCI. Over the years, he has overseen all aspects of a vector management program from the program's inception to the elimination of risk. While managing all of VDCI's ground-based vector surveillance and control programs, Dr. Markowski was on the front lines of the nation's various mosquito-borne disease outbreaks from West Nile virus in multiple states to Zika virus in the Caribbean. He worked with local agencies to quell those outbreaks. In his capacity as an aerial division manager, he has coordinated aerial responses to every major hurricane event in the U.S. since 2004, in addition to numerous disease outbreaks in the U.S. And despite all the mosquito work, he's found a way to keep his hands in the tick world by establishing several small tick surveillance and management programs in the Northeast. Since graduate school, managing Lyme disease and other tick-borne infections has been one of his passions. In spring of 2022, he left VDCI and has become the technical advisor for the American Mosquito Control Association, or AMCA. In this new capacity, he will represent the association's members on all operational, technical, legislative, and regulatory matters related to the vector surveillance and control industry. Welcome, Dr. Markowski. And uh, last but not least, of course, our moderator, uh, Nina Dacko, who's a member of our committee. Nina has had a passion for working with insects ever since she was very young. She obtained her bachelor's in science degree in entomology from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2006, and a master's of science in environmental toxicology from Texas Tech University in 2011. She has studied mosquitoes and been involved in mosquito surveillance and control activities in Illinois, California, and Texas since 2006. She developed and led the mosquito control program at Tarrant County Public Health in Fort Worth from 2013 to 2022 and is currently the Associate Director of the Mosquito Vector Control Division at Harris County Public Health Department. Currently, she is the Chair of the Control Strategy Subcommittee for the American Mosquito Control Association, Texas Mosquito Control Association past president and serves on other various vector control committees in the National Association of City and County Health Officials, or NACHO, and the National Environmental Health Association, which hopefully you're familiar with Niha, you're here today. Um, and with that, I will um, hand it over to Nina. I just wanted to remind everybody, if you do have questions or comments, to please put those in the Q&A box. And with that, I will pass it to Nina. Thank you. All right. Thank you so very much for that introduction. And um, Welcome our panelists. As a reminder, if you would turn on your camera and when I am speaking to you, if you would turn, um, um, make sure that your mic is working at the time. Um, I just want to give everyone a heads up of how these questions were actually developed. They were developed by our, um, our subcommittees. We kind of um, formulated them separately, got together and uh, figured out some questions to ask our panelists generally, and then they were uh, tailored a little more specifically towards their um, professions. And so the way that I'm going to go is I'm going to I'm going to ask each panelist a question uh, that has been formulated, um, and then we'll go around and do that once again. Um, so we may not get to a lot of questions in the Q&A uh, box, but we'll, we'll try to get as many as we can. And so I'm going to start and dive right in with uh, uh, Dr. Connolly. And so uh, these are specifically tailored towards uh, CDC type questions. So Dr. Connolly, um, I'm just going to start with one question, let you answer it, and then go into the next portion of this question. What is the CDC definition of a vector and how is it different from a pest of public health importance? 
Hi, Nina. Thanks. That's a great question. Um, the, the CDC definition is the same strict definition that I think you heard um, Caroline mention. So, so vectors are living organisms that can transmit pathogens, infection, infectious pathogens, either between humans or from animals to humans. And um, here in the Division of Vector-Borne Diseases where I work, we work specifically with the vectors, mosquitoes, ticks, and fleas. And then we have the Division of Vector um, Parasitic Diseases in Atlanta that works specifically with mosquitoes that transmit the malaria parasite. But, um, but that strict definition of vector doesn't change over time, but as evidence may come about where we can um, add species to a list of known vectors. An example might be with West Nile virus, where you know, initially when we saw it in the US, we knew there were some Culex vectors involved. And then over time, um, we, we discovered that other Culex species were involved as well. So we would add them to our list of vectors. Um, I would like to say though that with evidence, we can add adjectives <laughs> to the vectors that, that, that tell a little more about what type of vector they are. Um, so Caroline mentioned um, endemic vectors. Those would be endemic mosquitoes that would be involved in transmission. Um, exotic vectors, those would be ones that may be new to a region. There can be biological vectors and this is where the pathogen um, develops or multiplies inside the host. Um, and then uh, before they're transmitted to another host. And that's what we work with here in the Division of Vector-Borne Diseases. And then there are mechanical vectors. So those are ones where the pathogen doesn't undergo development inside the arthropod, but it, it's transferred um, to a new host, perhaps from something like contaminated mouth parts from horse flies or stable flies. Um, and then I think um, Caroline also mentioned the term bridge vector. We hear this most often associated with the cycle of Eastern equine encephalitis virus. This is where the virus is maintained within birds, primarily in swamps and bogs and, um, and Culicida melanura mosquitoes. But then other mosquito species come, come in and feed on these infected birds and essentially move the virus um, from the swamp cycle out to humans and, and horses. And um, those, those other mosquito species have been determined bridge vectors. So, so there's lots of ways to describe vector. Um, and then getting to your question about the difference between a vector and a pest of public health importance. I think for the, the easiest way to describe this is that um, um, pests of public health importance um, are really, um, the, the EPA is required by uh, federal pesticide law to uh, develop this list. And they do that in coordination with um, Department of Health and Human Services, as well as the Department of Agriculture. And they're required to identify this um, pest list of um, significant public health importance um, and, and also to develop uh, programs that will improve and facilitate the safe and necessary use of chemicals, biologicals, and other methods to control those pests. So EPA interprets that term, significant public health importance, broadly. So it includes um, pests that are uh, widely recognized, that, that present a widely recognized risk to a large number of people. So the EPA list. Uh, may include or does include mosquitoes, ticks, and fleas, such as the vectors that we work with, but they also include pests that don't necessarily transmit a pathogen, but they can cause allergies, asthma, rashes, um, skin irritation, food contamination, and, and direct injury. All right, um, and, and kind of um, bridging that um, into the public health, pests of public health importance, there's been some academic publications that have stayed certain insects like bed bugs, for example, which has been listed as a, a pest of public health importance, but not a vector, uh, was able to transmit Trypanosoma cruzi. Um, and for those of you who don't know, that is the agent that causes Chagas disease from kissing bugs. Um, however, bed bugs have been demonstrated to actually be able to transmit this to mice in the lab. How does this vector from vector competence out in the field rather than in a laboratory? Uh, great question. Um, we know that um, vector competence, it, it is the ability of an of a, uh, arthropod to transmit a pathogen after ex it's been exposed to a pathogen. Um, in the lab, we can, we can do these exposures and, and then we can determine if the, um, we'll call it a mosquito in this case, if they're able to um, have that pathogen develop or multiply inside the mosquito body and then eventually be, be transmitted to a new host. We can class, you know, however, depending on our sample size, we can say, we may end up with results that say it's, it's highly efficient or it's moderately efficient or it's inefficient. And um, the one thing we know about lab experiments though is 
they're they're in a lab, and um, you know the results we get may be different from what actually happens in nature. So um, these experiments that are done can vary. The, the results you get can vary depending on the arthropod strain that's used. Uh, the pathogen strain that is used, the temperature, and then there's a whole host of other variables that may have, have an impact on, on your results for what you see in the lab. Um, so we, we could have vectors that in the lab are determined to be efficient, but in nature they may never be important in, in epidemic transmission. So those lab studies actually help us to understand the potential or the probability for species to become part of that arboviral transmission cycle. So, so what, yeah, what is found in the lab doesn't necessarily equate to one that's going to be important in the field. Right. And that being said, that's why we have controlled environments in the lab. <laughs> so thank you for that. I'm going to um, move on and I will be asking you another question in a, in a few after the other panelists. All right. So, um, I'm going to move on to uh, Captain Saeed. Um, so we know that you work in the National Park Service. Uh, so what role does the National Park Service play in surveillance for vectors in and around our national parks? Yeah, thanks for that. So yeah, I think I'm in a very unique position working for the National Park Service. Um, because of our mission, which includes um, preserving unimpaired the natural and cultural resources and values within our parks, um, it does give us a sort of unique perspective and it really um, uh, pushes us very directly into the One Health Principle and this idea that animal health, human health, and environmental health are inextricably linked. So because of that, it affects how we deal with um, vectors. So for mosquitoes, for example, the service allows mosquitoes on park lands to exist unimpeded unless they pose a specific human or wildlife health risk. And so for us, surveillance is incredibly important because identifying actually whether the mosquitoes on the park lands are the kinds that can um, transmit pathogens or if whether those pathogens are present really does make a big difference in how we manage them um, because it really lets us know if it is a public health importance or not. That being said, our, um, our capacity is limited. Um, there was a focus during the introduction of West Nile virus, and again during Zika, to do mosquito surve surveillance within parks. But since that time, um, it has died down, and it really is park dependent. Um, I would like to point to parks in Florida and then um, Cape Cod and Fire Island as parks have been particularly proactive in this area. Um, we do have service-wide guidance that will be coming out soon, really encouraging parks to um, to to work with their local mosquito control or local health departments um, in, a in a cooperative way to try and understand the, um, the vectors and the pathogens, the mosquitoes and the pathogens that are there on park lands. I mean, really based on that, then um, management can, can go from there. We do use larvicides, um, but we rarely, if ever, would um, use um, an adulticide um, and would choose closure actually over the use of adulticide um, in many situations. We really do take an integrated pest management approach, again, recognizing the interconnectedness of environment, um, animals, and humans. Um, with ticks, we do have ongoing um, tick surveillance um, since 2014 using the CDC protocol um, in a number of different parks, um, mostly in the United, Eastern United States. Um, within NPS, we'll identify the ticks, and then CDC helps us with pathogen detection. Um, and we've actually been able to do a number of studies um, based on those results including looking at how deer management might impact the um, existence of the tick and the pathogen. Um, fleas, we don't really have flea surveillance, but we do look for, um, for any animal die-offs that would alert us to the potential um, existence of plague. And then based on that, there will be some management actions. All right, and then I would imagine that there is going to be occasions where outbreaks may be sourced from parks. Um, and so um, what is the process that you follow to get those this kind of information out to uh, other folks who may need to know, like local epidemiologists, for example? Yeah, um, so at first I'd like to say that it's really hard with a lot of vector-borne diseases to know exactly where it was sourced. You know, we do often run into this in the, in the occupational health world. You know, if someone, um, if an employee is diagnosed with Lyme disease, it's very difficult to actually prove where they, where they had that bite. Um, that being said, we will, um, we, we will respond to outbreaks and clusters um, for vector-borne illnesses as any other outbreak and follow the, the steps of an outbreak investigation. Um, in the epidemiology branch, I'd like to kind of give the disclaimer here that 
I'm the only member of it right now. So clearly, clearly there's limits in what I can, what we can do across the whole National Park Service. And I really see my job as um, being a liaison between um, the park community and then local local public health, state public health, and the CDC. Um, so it's it's rare, or I can't even think of a situation in which we would not um, partner up um, and work as a group with many many different stakeholders, including locals, local and state health, um, and CDC. Um, based on that, um, and based on the community on the populations that are affected, because remember we have our employees, we have concessioners, we have contractors. We have visitors, we have a range of different people who are living and working and visiting the parks. We will tailor our communications and those may include internal emails, websites, internal and external websites, public press releases, social media posts. It really depends on the situation. So what you're saying is you can't do it all. <laughs> okay. Well, we, and, and, and you know, we need to integrate with our partners and that was, I think, uh, I believe it was uh, covered by a uh, our presentation as well. Carolyn, thank you for covering that. And uh, next I will move on to uh, Dr. Markowski. All right, so uh, Dr. Markowski, what is the best way to balance the variability of the vectors of concern that you have in your area? So uh, mosquitoes and ticks, we know that like the Northeast has a lot of ticks, for example, whereas maybe not be an issue in other places. Dan, you're on mute. Um, it had to be one of us. <laughs> it's a great question. There are a number of things I, I, in my experience, there's there's a number of similarities between mosquito and tick management programs. Perhaps the most important would be their basis in surveillance. You you have to rely your management program, regardless of what it is, on a on strong surveillance program. Number one, to determine the species you're dealing with, but then the presence or absence of disease within those species. So that's a it's it's a huge similarity that they both have. Another similarity is if you are going to get into management and you're going to get into pesticide applications, you generally have to have a pesticide license, state state license. Um, so in there, most states, they're, they're the same. It's a public health license that you would get, which would work for either. So there are some similarities, but there are differences. One of those would be timing very often. You know, tick management um, strategies can very often be done at the tail ends of the summer in the early, early spring or in the, into the fall, where mosquito management programs focus most of their efforts in the uh, summertime midsummer months. So it, it allows for mosquito control districts that have boots on the ground, so to speak, conducting mosquito surveillance and control operations all year to be able to pivot to tick surveillance and control operations quite well. Some of the other differences would be the types of, you know, when we talk about uh, habitat modifications or source reduction for mosquitoes, we're typically talking about water bodies, water sources. And ticks, you'd be talking about widening trails, putting mulch down, you know, things of that nature to deter the number of ticks coming in contact with people. So there are quite a few similarities, um, primarily with your staffing, I would suggest, and the concept behind surveillance. But then the differences would get when kind of the rubber meets the road, so to speak, and you get to the actual individual strategies. All right. And being that we probably know a bit more about mosquito control strategies rather than tick strategies, is there any crossover that you can see there? Is there any kind of mosquito control strategy that you can actually see working for ticks as well? Yeah, I well, I think primarily, you know, when you when you look at a, a true um, a tick management strategy, you know, you're gonna you're gonna do a fully integrated approach from the perhaps uh, host reduction to habitat modifications, public awareness, etc. But when you get into the applications, if you're going to get into applications, you generally don't want to do large scale, you know, aerial applications for ticks. You're going to do smaller, what they call barrier type applications. And a lot of mosquito control programs have that equipment. They do barrier type applications for mosquitoes on people's properties. So there's a huge similarity there, I think. The other similarity would be in your uh, public education program, your community outreach. 
Um, mosquito control districts are very familiar with that. And we have, you know, most everyone has some sort of a public education campaign. They contact the public, they get the message out, uh, personal precautions, tick management programs would, it, it would dovetail extremely well into that. And you could, you know, touch on both topics at the same time. All right. Thank you. I'm going to move uh, back on over to uh, Dr. Connolly. Um, so, uh, Dr. Connolly, what is the level of support that CDC can provide to federal, state, and local agencies? And how do these interactions take place? Okay, Nina, I have six things to cover, and I'll try to go through them quickly, but if you need to cut me off, please feel free to do so. Um, so one of the ways is, uh, one of the primary ways is through the uh, supporting a federal agency is through working with the uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency. Uh, this would be through consultation after a disaster is declared and a mosquito control program request to be reimbursed for mosquito abatement. So, so part of the eligibility review for, for that reimbursement for mosquito abatement activities includes a consultation between FEMA and CDC, and mainly we're looking at surveillance data and some of the other pieces of information that FEMA requires. Um, we also can provide um, um, state and local assistance. I will say, you know, again, very clearly that I think I've heard before, you know, vector surveillance and control is local and uh, local and state-based, but we, CDC can provide um, direct assistance in the form of on-site subject matter experts, um, but the state, territorial, tribe, and local government must invite us in. This has to be a formal request. We don't just show up automatically um, in the, um, uh, but we do have uh, good resources here. We've got experts who can talk about integrated mosquito management, um, surveillance and control. We've got teams that can help with additional surveillance or guidance um, on um, control methods in a, during an outbreak. Um, there may also be um, in the state tribal and territorial agricultural and health departments, they may also have subject matter as experts. So, you know, that would be kind of the first step before um, you would um, ask um, the federal agency to, to provide assistance. Um, the third item I want to mention is that sometimes Congress approves funding um, through CDC that would go to a local health department um, for disease outbreaks, for example, with Zika or natural disasters. The most recent example of that would be um, fund, hurricane funding from Hurricanes Ian and Fiona, and there was some funding there that was um, states that were eligible were Florida, South and North Carolina, and, and also Puerto Rico. So we have to have these mechanisms in place to be able to get funds um, you know, to the health department. Sometimes the health department uses them directly, sometimes they're passed through to a, a vector control program. Um, we also have uh, Centers of Excellence in Vector-Borne Diseases. These, these were created during the Zika response um, and they continue to this day. So there was initial five-year funding and the idea was there were, there were these regional centers that had a reach that you know, CDC couldn't have with just you know, the, the staff we have here. And the goal was, we had several goals, is, is to conduct research on ways to prevent ticks, tick and mosquito bites or suppress populations of regionally important ticks and mosquitoes and their pathogens, um, to train a new generation of public health entomologists to serve as vector-borne diseases uh, experts at state and local levels, and also to strengthen the collaboration between um, all the entities that may be working in this, in this arena. So vector management, um, state, local health departments, um, um, and part of this was to develop, evaluate, and implement strategies that would suppress those arthropods and the pathogens they spread. Um, we had a second five-year round of funding that was, um, has been uh, in place for about a year now. There are four centers regionally. Um, and then at the end of this month, we're going to have uh, some additional centers. Um, they're, they're similar to the Centers of Excellence, but they're called um, Training and Evaluation Centers. The primary difference between the two is that um, with the training and evaluation centers, they're, they're really required to focus more on evaluating techniques and products that are already on the market, um, you know, whether it's efficacy or improvement of the way a product is used. So um, looking at things that are not in, still in the development phase. 
And then the last thing I'll mention uh, if the ways we can provide support is through our website. You know, anything we put on our website related to um, describing disease cycles, um, vectors, we have information on vector surveillance, repellents. Um, we also have a, a wonderful, a newly expanded library of mosquito images. Those are there for your taking for anyone to use in their presentations or their program. So um, feel free to take any of those. You don't have to ask. Those are just there for, for your use. So, so those are the six main ways. <laughs> All right, thanks. That's a lot of information there. So thank you for that. And I've I've personally used those pictures myself, and it's a great resource on the on the CDC website. So thank you. All right, we're gonna move on um, to Captain Saeed again. Um, what role do you think that climate change plays in the distribution and potential introduction of invasive vectors? You're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> Simple question that I should be able to cover in a couple seconds, right? Um, yes, so climate change. Um, we know that climate is one of the factors that influences the distribution of vector-borne diseases. Um, milder winters, early springs, warmer temperatures, um, the potential for more floods or droughts, they can all impact both pathogens and then the vector survival and distribution. So for example, if we even just think about pathogens, regard, not even thinking about the vectors, um, we know that Vibrio bacteria have been identified further um, north um, in the oceans than previously, thought because of changes in sea temperature and salinity. And the fungi that cause um, valley fever has been found in areas in the Pacific Northwest that it wasn't sound, found before. So those are the pathogens. If we move on to vectors, um, with the mosquitoes, um, the temperature can affect the lifetime of the vector or the reproduction. Um, and because of the short life cycle um, and the rapid response to increased temperatures, um, it, this can allow for a population, population expansion in a short period of time. Um, with ticks, it takes longer for the population to expand, but the increased temperature um, or for the potential for increased temperature is thought to um, affect their ability to overwinter by shortening their maturation time. Um, so we are seeing um, uh, a spread uh, of Ixodes scapularis, for example, um, now identified in Canada and North in Norway, so moving further north than we previously had before. So those are the vectors. And then corresponding to that, we are also seeing changes in the incidence of disease. So for example, um, from 2014, sorry, from 2004 to 2018, the number of reported illnesses from mosquito, tick, and flea bites has more than doubled. And there are nine new pathogens that were discovered or introduced into the United States. Um, so, you know, we are seeing changes in, in vectors and we are seeing changes in disease. However, it is important to, to recognize that the relationships between all of this is, are very complex. Um, and there are also um, uh, effects that are from land use, for example, or human behavior or um, migration, human migration or animal migration. Um, and so it, um, this really truly is a One Health issue. It's great that this is being talked about on this call because it really does require a collaborative approach to understand what are we currently seeing and thus potentially what may, what may we see in the future and trying to model what we may see based on um, project, projected changes. Thank you. Um, you managed to put so much information in this little compact <laughs> package right there. So thank you for that, um, that answer because that was a very complex question even though it was only you know, one sentence question. It's it's a complex one, and I guess you really painted a bright future for us. Um, <laughs> we'll <laughs> move on to Dr. Markowski with our our final question, unless we have some time for more. Um, so, Dr. Markowski, um, being that you've helped out with vector control tactics all around the entire country and even out of the country, uh, what are some of the best strategies that you've seen to address um, vector issues? And uh, are there program initiatives that are better at addressing at-risk populations than others? I think I think that's a that's a, it's a potentially a long question that I don't know that I'll have enough time to go through it all. But I think the uh, I think the the best thing I've seen, or the first thing that that I think I wish every program would do, would be to number one recognize that there's a potential problem, mosquito or tick, or flea. 
recognize that and then do the proper community engagement, public relations to make sure that the public is aware of these concerns so that then you can be, you can get to the next level, whether of surveillance that will then lead to whatever that management practice is, whether it be, you know, source reduction, habitat modifications, pesticide applications, you name it, clo closing of parks or trails, you name it. Um, but I think the programs that commu that communicate and work with the public the mo are typically the most effective because you get the community buy-in. They understand that there's an issue. They understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. Because even something as, as simple perhaps as widening, widening a trail to, to not have you know people come in contact with ticks, I, I've seen the public not like that because it looks, you know, it doesn't look right. You know, I want a more natural, you know, trail and more, more natural escape. Once they understand that why you're doing that, though, most understand, well, this is okay, this makes sense. And they and they can they can get behind it. And that flows no matter what you're dealing with. So I think the most important thing to deal with is start with community involvement, engagement, and recognition that there is a concern that we're going to address this way. All right. Um, thank you for that as well. And with that, we only have about five minutes left. And so um, I'm going to actually, um, let's see, call us back and, and to Nicole. Nicole, do we have time for any questions or is there um, a certain method that uh, will you take questions down for us and we can go ahead and address those um, in the long term? Yes, absolutely. Um, I see that our panelists and speaker today have been addressing questions in the Q&A Q &A box, so thank you for that. Um, if you do have any additional questions that you would like passed on to our speaker today or our panelists, please add those in to the um, post survey, evaluation survey, that you will receive the link for uh, after the webinar today. Um, thank you, Nina, for leading a great discussion and to our panelists for sharing great content and information for our audience today. Um, I'll go ahead with a few final announcements um, all of you may be interested in. Uh, this year, NEHA is hosting our 86th Annual Educational Conference in New Orleans, uh, July 31st through August 3rd. Uh, the theme is Raise the Voice of Your Environmental Health Workforce. The AEC provides a unique opportunity to network with hundreds of environmental health professionals and those just beginning their careers in environmental health. Uh, let me share that our keynote speakers for this year are Dr. Maureen Lichtfield, uh, who is Dean and Professor for the School of Public Health at Jonas Salt, and retired Lieutenant General uh, Russell Honore, who held the role of Commander of the Joint Task Force following Hurricane Katrina. And this year's AEC will host several sessions focused around the field of vector control. Uh, August 1st sessions will include a rodent symposium, effective communications, control practices, and utilizing resources presented by the City of New Orleans Mosquito, Termite, and Rodent Control Board, the University of Miami, and Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Services as well as past, present, and future rodent and mosquito-borne disease preparedness in the city of New Orleans, also presented by City of New Orleans Mosquito Termite and Rodent Control Board. Uh, August 3rd, we will have Infection Control and Biosafety for the Environmental Health Professional, presented by Vanderbilt University and American Company. And lastly, you won't want to miss the Missouri uh, Tick-Borne Disease Story Map to be revealed by the Missouri uh, Department of Health and Senior Services Bureau of Environmental Epidemiology. For more details about sessions and the entire conference agenda, please visit uh, neha.org forward slash AEC. I would like to thank our speaker and panelists, Dr. Caroline Efstafion, uh, Dr. Roxanne Connolly, Dr. Maria Saeed, and, and Dr. Daniel Markowski, today's host, Vector Control Committee Chair, George Carroll, and our moderator, our Vector Control Subcommittee Chair, Nina Daco. 
for partnering today and bringing great content and discussion to today's webinar. And to our audience, thank you so much for attending today's webinar. As a reminder, each of you will receive a link uh, for that post-evaluation survey upon conclusion of the webinar. Please take a few moments to complete it as we would really appreciate your feedback, comments, and recommendations. Thank you again. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day and goodbye. Thanks all.